It worked. <clears throat> Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the gift of salvation that you've given us in your son, that without deserving any of this, uh, you have bestowed that blessing of salvation on us, and we can enjoy it now and into eternity. We thank you and praise you for your written word that we can read about your son and his sacrifice for us and also for your plan of the ages and how you have things in your hand, even though there seems to be chaos as a rule. We know that you are in control. Lord, I pray as we dig into your word this morning that you would drive the distractions of today out of our minds so we can focus just on you and on your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. Now I have a <clears throat> strange voice today. We're going to see about getting through all of this. Um, if you can't hear me, there's lots of space up front. Uh, these seats go for the same price as the ones in the back. So... You can feel free to move up. Um, <clears throat> so Jesus died on the 14th of Nisan, the 14th of the month of Nisan, um, in fulfillment or bringing fullness to Pesach, Passover. The next day on the 15th of Nisan, he rested in the tomb uh, having been afflicted with our sin, even though he was without sin, bringing fullness to matzah, the feast of unleavened bread. <clears throat> and on the third day, as the priests began to wave the first fruit offerings before the Lord, Jesus rose from the grave, the first fruits among many, bringing fullness to Bikarim, the day of the first fruits. And then the priests began counting 49 days or seven weeks. And on the 50th day, uh, the Jews were to gather again for Shavuot and celebrate the giving of the Torah and God's liberation of uh, Israel from Egypt. And Jesus gave his Holy Spirit to us on that day that we commemorate with the Greek word Pentecost or Pentecostes, bringing fullness to the fourth uh, festival day of Israel. So Jesus has brought forth uh, fullness to each one of the first four of the seven um, festival days. There's three left to go <clears throat> that are in the fall, and they're not quite as um, festival-oriented. Uh, the first couple are very um, uh, big times of lament and judgment in Israel. And the first of those we'll talk about today, which is Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, they call it, even though there was no feasting involved. <clears throat> Turn with me to Leviticus in chapter 23. <clears throat> you know, this water has a grape flavor to it. And it's actually oddly satisfying when you have a phlegmy throat. <laughs> We'll start at verse 23. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaiming or proclaimed with the blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. And this is also recorded with more detail about the 
various sacrifices to be conducted at the temple in Numbers chapter 29, if you want to read there. God calls this a memorial, a zikron. It's a memorial or a remembrance. <clears throat> he doesn't tell us, he doesn't tell the Jews what they're to remember in this, which he often wouldn't do. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so the Jews have contemplated it over the years and have come up with what I believe is a correct statement that it commemorates Exodus chapter 19. So we'll turn over to Exodus chapter 19. Now the Israelites have come out of Egypt to Mount Sinai and are um, wondering what's next, okay? Now we know that uh, God gave the Torah, the law to Moses during this time. We know that when God gave the Torah to them, uh, they broke virtually every one of those uh, in a matter of a, a few moments <clears throat> at the golden calf. And uh, Moses had the men of the tribe that were with him, uh, the men of Israel go through with their swords and 3,000 died that day. And then at Shavuot or Pentecost, a couple of thousand years later, when the Jews were commemorating that day, 50 days after Jesus rose from the grave, uh, why 3,000 people came to new life. So we know that um, event happened. Well, as God is preparing to give them the law, here's what it says, uh, 19 and right at verse 1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. <clears throat> they set out from Raphadim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my uh, treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. There are, uh, these are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded them. All the people gathered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of the people, and you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. 
Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall uh, touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. We'll pause right there. So God is visiting Israel for the first time as a people, and he is going to deliver his word. Now, here's what he says next. Uh, Take care not to go up or touch the mountain um, or the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch it or touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. When the trumpet sounds, that's the first use of the word trumpet in scripture. The word there in Hebrew is yobel, or yobel, and it actually means the ram's horn. Now, a ram's horn uh, trumpet is also called and normally called in Hebrew, the shofar. And uh, that's what the rabbi was playing there in that little clip at the beginning. (laughs) The, The word shofar does not mean ram's horn, it means blowing. So specifically from a yobel. So the shofar is the the word that the the Hebrews use uh, to talk about the ram's horn trumpet. And now God's shofar was a herald for Israel to assemble to receive her covenant. Okay. Now, on the first day of the month. Remember, the Jews had a lunar calendar, not a solar calendar. The first day of the month was always the new moon, which means there's no moon at all. It is the darkest day uh, of the month. And this is the seventh month, the month of Tishri. So the first day is always the new moon. It's always the darkest day of that period. Okay, now the priests were to blow the shofar according to Leviticus 23. It was a time where um, uh, they were to blow lots of trumpets. Back in Leviticus 23 and 24, Um, yeah, it's a memorial proclaimed with blasts of trumpets. And what the priests would do is there would be one priest who would stand on the highest point in the temple and blow the shofar as loud as he could in various cadences, usually a cadence of 70 short toots, followed by 30 longer toots and in different orders and that sort of thing that actually all means something to the Hebrews. And then that sound could travel about three miles or so from the top of the temple, which was at at the high spot in Jerusalem. And there would be more priests surrounding who would then blow their trumpets And those trumpets could be heard two or three miles. And there would be more priests who would blow their trumpets so that the trumpet blast was heard all over the nation of Israel during that time. So it was literally calling the Israelites to something. In Leviticus 23 again, um, right after that little paragraph about the Feast of Trumpets, 
goes right into the day of atonement. Verse 26, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, now on the 10th day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. Okay, so the darkness is nearly over, right? The, the, the moon is advancing in its size. It's not yet full. And then um, verse tw uh, 33, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying on the 15th day, which would be the full moon, 15th day of the seventh month. And for seven days is the feast of booths to the Lord. So here are the three fall feasts, beginning with uh, Yom HaTeruah. Yom Teruah, the feast of blowing or the feast of the trumpets. And God is calling them to prepare themselves. First, at Sinai, to prepare themselves to receive their covenant. And this time, the next occurrence of the word trumpet or anything related to a trumpet um, in scripture comes when God gives a direction to the Israelites for this day of, of, of remembrance. And it prepares them to come to Jerusalem for something more. And that would be to receive their new covenant. Well, there's a problem though. 70 AD, the temple was destroyed and Israel was dispersed all around the world eventually. So there is no temple from which to blow the trumpet. And so the Jews didn't know what to do about that. And as they are wont to do, they created a kind of their own um, way of uh, approaching God with their sin before the um, Day of Atonement comes. And they call it Rosh Hashanah. <clears throat> Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year. It's often just called the, the Jewish New Year, um, but actually the Jews have four different months that they call the, the New Year. And this particular month, the seventh month, the harvest is complete and uh, the growing season's behind them. It begins the next growing season period. So it's the beginning of the agricultural and civil New Year. <laughs> Excuse me. Take a fisherman's friend here. And we all thought Johnny was the fisherman's friend. So Rosh Hashanah, as is the day of trumpets, Rosh Hashanah is recognized by the Jews as a day of great judgment. Why is that? Turn with me. Probably keep your finger in, Jer in Leviticus. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 30. Ooh, way too far. Okay. okay, I'm going to read it from the complete Jewish Bible. So I don't even need to turn there. I got it written here. That, that paraphrase of scripture written by the, uh, or compiled by Messianic Jews, Jews who believe in Christ Jesus as Messiah. 
Jeremiah 30 and verse 7 from the complete Jewish Bible reads, how dreadful that day will be. There has never been one like it, a time of trouble for Yaakov, Jacob, but out of it, he will be saved. This is the time, the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. When <clears throat> God blows his last shofar. In Zechariah 1, I'll just read it in verse 14, again from the complete Jewish Bible. The great day of Adonai, the great day of the Lord, is near, near and coming very quickly. Hear the sound of the day of the Lord, the day of Adonai. When it's here, even a warrior will cry bitterly. That day is a day of fury, a day of trouble and distress, a day of waste and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick fog, a day of the shofar, <coughs> and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the high towers on the city walls. The day of the Lord is the day of the shofar when um, the time of Jacob's trouble begins. That would be the tribulation. In the Talmud, that body of text that the Jews rely on, uh, and started writing about the fourth century after Christ um, that interprets in their mind the, uh, the Torah and the prophets. In Mishnah Rosh Hashanah 1.2, it reads, the world is judged at four intervals of the year. At Pesach, regarding produce, at Shavuot, regarding the fruit of trees, on the new year, that is the first, of the, day, first day of the month of Tishri, or Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpets, all who have entered the earth pass before him, one by one, like sheep, and on Sukkot, with regard to rainfall, uh, for the coming year. Sukkot is the Feast of Booths. So the Jews recognize that this is a time of great judgment, and ultimately, um, conservative Jews who understand uh, the scripture as literally, uh, rather than just figuratively, understand that, that this is a time when um, the time of Jacob's trouble begins, the tribulation. They say that Rosh Hashanah is a time when every person's fate is inscribed. The righteous names are written in God's book of life, and the unrighteous names are written in God's book of death. There is no biblical um, support for any of that, but that's how they, that's how they view um, Rosh Hashanah's judgment. Most people they teach are not going to be written in one book or the other right away. So God has given them 10 days until the day of atonement to repent and do good deeds. And hopefully your good deeds will outweigh the bad deeds that you did in the previous year. So that you will end up being written in the, the book of life or inscribed in the book of life, as they would say. See, they don't see Rosh Hashanah's judgment, that, that period of time of judgment as the settling of their eternal fate. They see it simply as a settling of your temporal fate here and now for this coming year, right? 
God will judge their behavior in the past year. And if they can fix all that they did in the past year wrong and make it right so that the right outweighs the wrong, then he will bless them in the coming year. That's how they look at it. And they, they have a greeting. <clears throat> Uh, it means may you be inscribed for a good year. So um, when I went to um, a Rosh Hashanah service and participated uh, in Folsom uh, several years ago, um, my rabbi friend invited me to come. And uh, it was a very eye-opening and very depressing event. It was three days and the, the liturgy was all in Hebrew. So I was, I was lost, um, but I would stand when they stood and step back as they stepped back in their recitations of their liturgy and I would step forward and I would turn, I would do all the things that they were doing, even though I wasn't audibly saying any of it. And uh, realizing that these people for four hours a day, three or four hours a day without a break, these people were lamenting their sin to God and asking him to be kind to them in the future is what they were doing in the future year. And <clears throat> often during the service, they would say, Lashana Tova Tikataivu, and they would say it to individuals as a greeting coming and going. And, and during the, the service, there was a pause now and then between liturgical moments, and they would say that to one another. And the response would be Tikataivu, a good year to you. And, you know, they're hoping that God will see their works as favorable and will bless them. The first night is followed by a feast and uh, they eat various foods that I've never heard of before. And most of which I wouldn't care to have in my palate ever again. Um, but some of the nicer things were um, honey with apples, kind of a commemoration of coming into the land of milk and honey. Uh, they would eat bread and water, uh, kind of a commemoration of their own sin and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> you always wear, the men always wear a yarmulke or some kind of a head covering. And I uh, wore my fedora. The rabbi was fine with that. So that's what I would always wear whenever I would go visit him. And uh, there was a man who came into the, the feast before it started and he wasn't wearing a yarmulke. And he walked in the door and I, I could see him kind of rush into the crowd and walk as fast as he could away from everybody to get to a far corner of the room. And all the time, his, his wife is right behind him with a yarmulke, right? And he finally begrudgingly takes it and puts it on. And when we sat down to eat the meal, I positioned myself to sit next to the guy because it was pretty obvious that he didn't belong there. And I didn't belong there either, other than I was trying to learn. And uh, so I leaned over to him at the start of the meal and I said, it's pretty obvious that you and I don't belong here. And he looked at me and he says, oh, praise God, I'm a Christian too. <laughs> he says, my wife is Jewish and every year she makes me come here. And, and uh, anyway, I felt kind of bad for this, for this man who, uh, didn't want to be there. Um, and he could see the, the hopelessness of the situation as well. 
particularly being unequally yoked. But <clears throat> the second night um, we met at the rabbi's house and then went down to a nearby pond which because of California's drought was darn near dried up at the time. But one of the things that they do uh, worldwide on Rosh Hashanah is they will take and go to a body of usually standing water or the ocean, um, not usually a lake or a stream, but if that's all they have, that's what they'll do. And there are ways for city dwellers to actually recreate this using waters from the faucet and bowls and that sort of thing. And they would stand there with um, either stones in their pockets or uh, leavened bread, bread with hametz. Um, and they would, uh, the hametz representing sin in their life. And they would um, take the stones or the bread out and cast it into the sea. Um, as Mark prayed earlier, that God doesn't remember our sin as far as the East is from the West or uh, it's swallowed up by the sea. And there's an Old Testament passage that they refer to when they throw their sin into the sea in, in uh, demonstrating to God that this is what we're doing. We're, we're giving it up to you because you're gonna take it away because of our good deeds. So it was a time of great hopelessness, I found. And uh, the rabbi and several of the men invited me to come back 10 days, or it would have been like seven days later for their Yom Kippur service. And that was just too depressing, I thought, to go to that. So I mentioned this all to my messianic friend and and uh, he took me to a uh, messianic uh, synagogue in Sacramento, and we worshiped together with believing Jews um, on, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. It was a wonderful event. But in any case, I digress here. The Jews are doing these, these deeds at Rosh Hashanah to try and convince God that they are worthy to be inscribed. Now, there's nothing in what we read in Leviticus. And if you read in, in uh, the, the Numbers passage, Numbers 29, you'll find the same. There's nothing in the passage that says anything other than it's a commemoration, a day of rest and blowing horns, uh, particularly the, the ram's horn. And yet they have created this entire infrastructure around it to try and convince God that they are worthy. Um, and we need to be cautious of that ourselves, that we don't create our own trappings of righteousness to try and prove to God that, that we are worthy because we are not. Uh, the only thing that makes us worthy is his son and his son's sacrifice. We are not worthy in and of ourselves, but praise God, he is. So, God sounded the shofar at Sinai to herald Israel to come to the mountain, prepare themselves to receive their covenant. Can you see how Jesus could bring fulfillment to that? Um, to this um, time, which is a memorial to that. Well, it also looks forward to when God heralds Israel to come to receive her new covenant. Turn with me to Jeremiah again, and chapter 31 this time. Jeremiah 31 at 31. Okay. 31, 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, 
when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their, for, with their fathers on the day that I took them out of the, uh, took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant <coughs> that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will uh, be their God and shall, uh, they shall be my people and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me <clears throat> for the feast from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Okay. He says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, after the days of Jacob's trouble, the times of Jacob's trouble, this new covenant is all about Israel. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of uh, Jacob, of Judah. Okay, this is about Israel. We as the church in this age are extended those blessings. And we don't have time to go in um, today what those blessings are, but we receive the same blessings as uh, Israel will um, because of the Christ Jesus' sacrifice and that new covenant with Israel. Um, we are the residual uh, blessings from that. We receive those. So Israel accepts their new covenant after the time of Jacob's trouble when they turn to God. Okay. Will that day be a happy day for Israel when they finally turn to God and accept Jesus as Messiah? Let's look at a couple of the minor prophets that discuss this. Um, Amos and then Joel. Joel comes first, but we'll read Amos first. Amos in chapter five. And we'll read 18, 19, and 20. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the, the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Can you imagine running away from a lion and then there's a bear in the path right in front of you? Or went into the house and learned his hand, uh, leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? <clears throat> the gloom with no brightness in it? Okay, now flip over to Joel in chapter 2. Joel 2, and we'll start at verse 30 here. Okay, and I shall show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of, of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For 
in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. So God will turn out the lights. He will pour out his wrath on the wicked and bring Israel into repentance to receive their new covenant, which was enacted by Christ at the cross. It's symbolized by darkness, by the new moon. Um, it's symbolized by the, the sounding of trumpets in remembrance of God's first trumpet uh, when he blew the shofar at Mount Sinai and will blow it again to call Israel to prepare herself. Okay, how does Jesus involved in all of this? Let's close this up with a couple of New Testament passages. First Corinthians and chapter 15. First Corinthians 15. And I'll read 51 and 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. And look over at First Thessalonians now, and verse four. Uh, chapter four, sorry. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse 16. 16 and 17 say, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of, of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him, uh, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And then in chapter 5, verses 2 through 4, For you yourselves <clears throat> are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying there is peace and security. Then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are the children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. We'll just stop it there. So Jesus will herald nation Israel to prepare herself to receive the new covenant with the sound of God's last shofar. Now, does that mean it's the very last time God's ever going to have a trumpet blown? And I have to say no, because in Revelation, there's all sorts of trumpets being blown here and there, and there's trumpet judgments, and... <clears throat> that sort of thing. So we could um, talk about that and debate that um, ad nauseum, but Jesus is going to herald na nation Israel to prepare herself to receive her new covenant by blowing this last shofar. Simultaneous, so that brings fullness to Yom Teruah, the Feast of Blowing, right? But simultaneously, 
The mystery is that wasn't foretold in the Old Testament that the church will be removed out of harm's way at the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble when God judges the nations for what they have done to Israel and he prepares Israel through, through very hard times to um, prepare herself to receive their new covenant and accept uh, their atonement in Christ Jesus. It's always darkest before the dawn, um, and it is. And when Israel as a nation finally puts faith in Hamashiach Yeshua, in Messiah Jesus, and the nation collectively as a people, and they will call out to Jesus, Barach HaBo B'Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, as Jesus proclaimed in Matthew 23. Then he will return, gather up the believing Jews and the Gentiles uh, who remain in Jerusalem and will fully execute the new covenant with Israel. And then we have the day of atonement, which we'll talk about next time I'm here. We're getting close to the end of the feasts. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to look into your word, to see the things of your son. I pray that you would help us to take uh, these feasts, even though they are not directed to the church, but to Israel. But I pray that you would help us to take them and to see your son in them, to see your plan of the ages in them being affected through your son. We praise you for this time when you've given us your Holy Spirit to eliminate your word, to give us comfort, to give us wisdom, to give us hope. And as a seal until your son comes, we look for his coming at any moment. And it's in great, his great and glorious name we pray. Amen.